Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Hilaritas Podcast with me, your host, Mike Gathers. Join me here and now as we explore the vast world of iconic writer, psychedelic psychologist, rebel philosopher, and self-proclaimed agnostic mystic, Robert Anton Wilson. Visit us at hilaritaspress.com slash podcast for show notes, links, and past episodes. And right here, right now, it is my great pleasure to share with you my chat with returning guest, writer John Higgs. John Higgs, welcome back to the Hilaritas podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a it's a pleasure to be back. Nice to talk to you, Mike. Yeah, yeah. You have been busy. Every time I, I turn around, it seems like you've got a a few new projects going on and you just dusted off some of your old works as well yeah i do i do need to keep a roof over my head <laughs> I <have> to, <laughs> so i have to keep writing <laughs> basically yeah and um well since we're a robert anton wilson podcast we might as well dip into the the klf book here you you've re-released that as a hardcover yeah, it's a 10th anniversary edition. It's 10 years since it came out in paperback. The whole thing with that book is it's completely upside down and the wrong way around and, and so on. Uh, originally, it was just a self-published ebook back in the back when Kindles first appeared. And for the mm. first time, you could write something and get it out without having to worry about gatekeepers and things like that. Because I'm pretty sure I would not have been able to find a publisher who would have looked at that klf book and go this is what a book should be i'll put that on the shelves but i I didn't for for first time i didn't need to it was amazing so the fact that it's finally made it into you know hardback which is normally the uh you know the default starting point format it's very pleasing to me i have to say yeah so you've gone from kindle to paperback to hardback that's awesome yeah and um that was your second book is that correct after the leary biography it was yes that's right which i also went back to recently this year because it's now an audio book i think it's only out in the uk at the moment but next year it should be out uh in america okay Um, you mentioned that over email and i looked and i didn't mm -hmm. see it so i wasn't sure if it was out yet i don't i don't know what the dates for this are but i think the the leary book and the klf will get an american uh publication next year including audio so fingers crossed that'll that'll finally work and what was it like dusting off these uh not just old projects but your first projects yeah very how you know i was not uh, i was not looking forward to it (laughs) i have to say because god it's about 18 years ago i wrote that book and also it was in Mm. um it was in the the two thousands. It was in the middle of the two thousands, which are a very different time to where we are now. And uh, on a, a a subject like Timothy Leary, you know, which there are sensitivities around, I thought, oh God, I'm gonna I'm gonna be you know mortified by by what I've put here. Um, that wasn't really. There was one. There was one extra line I added. There was uh, some remarks about Leary about. Um, being a white person escaping from slavery when he was in Algiers with the, the Black Panthers. And I read that and I thought, oh, I just need to put yeah. a little a little <laughs> line there. But other than that, I didn't sort of touch anything. And I, I kind of felt that um, I was pleased that I'd written it then. Because if you were to write it now, you'd be sort of ending every other paragraph with, which of course is bad, well, you know, or, or something like that. <laughs> And the spirit of the thing goes, because what I liked about it was just how funny it was. How, but it, but it's it's almost like it's pretending it's not funny, but it is. Mm. It's kind of like the title, I Have America Surrounded. It sounds serious, but it's obviously a joke. And once you tune into that sort of level of humor, um, the whole book was, you know, it's mainly because I hadn't seen it for so long, but I was kept surprised been surprised by how funny i found the whole thing and that to me 
was an aspect of Leary that um, I'm pleased to have captured. You know, his, his sense of humour didn't always come across in his writings, but everyone who knew him, who, you, who I spoke to about him, you know, it was one of the first things that they would get across to me. Look, he was funny. That was the thing. He was funny. Right. A lot of this, he got the cosmic joke, you know. And um, so I'm pleased that, that, that the book's captured that, I, I think. I think it's been a while since I've read that one, but uh, that's what I remember and uh, or a big part of what I remember. And and just uh, the topic around Leary in general is so serious. You know, he's the yeah, maybe absolutely. best known today as the one who ruined the psychedelic movement or set it back 50 years or some some. Yeah, I mean, he's, like he's pretty much the scapegoat now. Right? Correct. It's like everything would be fine if it wasn't for like that guy. Um, and as so much research is happening now in the psychedelic field, if it takes a scapegoat to make that happen, then maybe that's okay. Maybe that's mm. okay. But I'm sure in 50 years time, we'll look back and, you know, he'll get his proper due, uh, when, when he's no longer needed as a sort of, you know, uh, an excuse. Mm, right. It, it will take some time there. Yeah, I think. <laughs> And and so and the KLF book, um, the thread of Robert Anton Wilson. I'm I'm surprised at how deep that runs through the book. And I and starting with the Ken Campbell Illuminatus play. Sure. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't know what it is. The amount of books that I write that are linked to uh, Matthew Street in Liverpool which is where mm. Ken Campbell put on, on the play and obviously where the Beatles came up, right, about the Beatles. I've just ghostwritten um, a book for a musician called Ian Brody of a band called The Lightning Seeds. And he starts, He start, when I first met him, he, he was telling me about, he was just a kid. He was like, he'd left school. He had no qualifications. He, had, he was just walking around Liverpool and he just went down this sort of, these, these back streets, these cobbled back streets with sort of abandoned warehouses where there was no reason to go at all. And he just sort of walked down there and he saw this, this building with a statue of Carl Jung outside and this, this sign saying Liverpool School of, um, oh, what was it? Um, it's something like music, art, dance and pun. Dream and pun. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it was. I go, what is that? That is strange. And then this this face peered around the door, and it was this this Irish poet called uh, Peter O'Halligan. Uh, and he saw this little kid, you know, looking and looking curious. And he just invited him him in for a cup of tea. And he he said, at that moment, my life began. That's how he mm. put it. You know, that was when everything fell on track and everything that's happened to him ever since comes from this moment because he he walked in and they were there was ken campbell and they were putting on the play of the illuminatus and he was carrying a guitar and they go oh we, we need a guitar player were you part of illuminatus and he's like yes he just knew at that point he had to agree to it you know it'd been very easy just to, to walk past this building but <laughs> sometimes a door opens and you're invited in and you have mm. to say yes and that was that was the moment um so yeah and of course all, all that sort of stuff is is um a lot of the backstory to the the klf in the klf book they're all that sort of figures and it ties you know that early yeah early sort of um Robert Anton Wilson influence in Britain um, to um, the pop charts to the later sort of things. It's uh, it's 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 the backstory and the, um, the mythology around it all. It's still still growing. You know, if you go to mm. Matthew Street now and you go down, there's a little side road. There's um, there's a huge mural on this on this uh, they've painted on this building and. Um, it's got you know a magnolia tree at the top, and it's got a walrus at the at the, at the bottom, and it, it all it all comes from um, those threads that so inspired the Illuminatus trilogy and uh, or the play of the Illuminatus trilogy in in particular. It's become um, it's become the myth of of that area now. Fascinating. 
there, there was something about the play itself. I heard you say, um, let me read it here. Everyone involved was deeply affected. Yeah. Yeah. They I, still talk, they still talk of it as, as you know, one of those uh, pivotal sort of moments in their lives. And it's amazing, you know, how, um, how many of the people involved have gone on to do great things. And, you know, if we talk about actors like Jim Broadbent, I think Bill Nye was, was part of it. Um, you know, Ian Brody, who I mentioned earlier, who was just the guitar player in the band. Right. And that led to the situation where he's gone on to be the only um, person to write a song that's gone to the UK number one uh, charts, uh, number one in the UK charts on four separate occasions. You know, his his career has become this this sort of great thing as well. It's, um, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, it's... Um, you know, sometimes you think, oh, we mythologize the past a little bit too much. You know, we we need we need to sort of you know, not be too fixated on on these things that we put on a pedestal, and uh, we need to look forward instead. But we kind of do need to put some things on a pedestal, and you know, if you choose the right ones, you know, it ain't that bad. I don't think it ain't that bad. As as we talk about this play, it. Um, it feels like it could be the subject of a John Higgs book. And, <laughs> and, and what I mean is just um, there's something about a lot of your writing where it documents uh, what in my mind are like wrinkles in the fabric of, of consciousness or, or shifts like this KLF phenomenon or William Blake. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are yeah, you, I think... Yeah, I think so. I think um, I think I'm attracted to the things that are generally overlooked in mm. this country. Um, there's a version of you know our culture that um, we sort of presented with from you know the mainstream media and the the uh, you know the the establishment as it as it were. Yeah. I've, got no interest in at all and i don't <laughs> recognize it and i've lived in this country for 52 years i was born here it's where i'm from the version of it that is presented to the you know the downton abbey type sort of mm. thing never seen it in my life i know nothing at all about it <laughs> but there, there is a version of uh of our culture that comes you know it's, maybe it starts with William Blake and it sort of mm. comes through and it includes things like the Beatles and there's um and it's rich in imagination and it's um magical on on many ways and I'm always conscious that if you go into you know the bookshop we have a chain called Waterstones here and you look at the history shelves and you know history is our story it's you know how we got to it's who we are it's how we became who we are and uh, yet you look at how it's told and it's all told through power they're all mm. books about power it might be military power or uh, you know symbolic power like monarchy a political power financial power all these sort of things it's not imagination you know? mm. and imagination can seem in that context, you know, like I was writing about the Beatles and James Bond, and it's just a song, it's just a film, you know, how does that matter compared to all this? But it really, I mean, it does, it, they're, they're very different things, power and imagination, but I kind of see them like fire and water, you know, they're, they're uh -huh. different and they act differently, but they're both equally powerful, you know, a, a forest fire and a tsunami will do a lot of damage in, in their own sort of way. And uh, our creative life, or our imagination, um, it does change history because it shapes, you know, it, it shapes our attitudes and our attitudes shape how we act and our acts, how we act is what sort of changes history. So you can't really tell the story of who we are and how we got to be here with just like, well, there was an election and there was this king and, and things mm. like that. It, yes, it doesn't, you know, you... You, you cannot explain who we are without you know the Beatles, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Right, and the, the amount of um, just there's just the 
yeah, the amount they changed, you know, the, the culture and, and they changed how we see the world and, and what we expect of things like that. So I'm, I'm always, um, you know, interested in those transformative areas um, of culture that are kind of overlooked and stuff like that, which is very much the KLF, mainly because they wanted to be, you know, written out of the history box they wanted to be sort of removed <laughs> from music musical history but they were you know they had a string of number one hits they were on top of the pops on the television in the newspapers you know they 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 happened um and like, the fact that they've been they were so you know that they seem to vanish and mm. be forgotten like that you know was uh and probably would have been if they hadn't have you know done the the great taboo of you know burning all that money right so they were the sense i get is unintentionally rich and famous they found themselves unintentionally rich and famous yeah i mean yeah they certainly put the work in to get uh to where they were but um they, they you know they originally they, they called themselves the justified angels of moo from 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 bob's illuminatus trilogy um who were connected to the music industry, you know, in, in that book. They were mentioned at a sort of few times, but they were very much the forces of chaos at mm. war against the music industry. Um, and that's sort of how they saw themselves. Um, but when it got to the point where, um, you know, there's a, there's a big uh, industry uh, award show here every year called the Brit Awards, and they were invited to open the Brit Awards and, um they they won the award for best band, but they were they won it. Um, they were jewel winners with Simply Red. You know, if you know Simply Red, um, very um, very middle of the road mm. sort of soul based sort of music. And it was like the music industry was saying, you know, you're you're the best a band can be. You're as good as Simply Red, you know, and it was uh, a very, very, very hard, hard thing to say. And the music industry will um, embrace anything that makes money. You know, you can't, you can't attack it, you can't destroy it. You know, the, the you know, the, the, the songs of Kurt Cobain are now like covered by the Muppets. You know, the, the, <laughs> the Sex Pistols was played in front of the Queen at the London Olympics. You know, things like that. It doesn't matter how radical you think you're being. You know, if it makes money, the industry will just take you, will absorb you. You know, you can't, um, uh, you can't escape the impossible. Inescapable. Yeah. So what they were what they were trying to do at that point was just to basically not play just to sort of walk away and so this is why they um they deleted their back catalog because right. they're independent and they could do and they could do that but my god that costs so much more money than they burnt in the long run and mm. that's why you'd never then hear the music you know in adverts or in film soundtracks or on video games or on compilation albums or uh, the, the usual afterlife of you know successful bands music they just cut all that out they just sort of stopped it and they sort of they just walked off and uh, had it not been for the fact that they still had all this money that came from their you know, ventures in the music industry which kind of tainted in their eyes you know it was it, it was it was not good money um they probably would have succeeded in in being forgotten and just mm. vanishing out of, out of the history books but because what they did to that money was such a taboo and so shocking and so unforgettable you know that that act has lingered and was it would it be fair to say they they kind of wanted to be forgotten but this this uh backfired i th I, I see it in those terms yeah okay i see it in those terms at least they certainly didn't do um you know, the, the, there's a sort of afterlife for bands. There's a sort of um, uh, a management of your 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 reputation and your legacy and and, and things like that, that that goes on these days. And they really weren't doing any anything like that at all. Anything. It's mm, kind it's yeah. kind of surprising now that in the last year or so they've sort of gone huh, and put their music back on well on Spotify. 
I noticed no that. one, no one thought they would ever do. Mm. You know, that that was really, really quite uh, shocking for many people. And as far as I can understand it, the reason is, you know, they're they're getting on in age. They don't want to leave a total mess for their <laughs> kids. They're trying to sort it all out first, you know, they're, for their families, basically, which I kind of think is a good good reason. Yeah, no, that's and and so if I if I heard you right, they deleted their back catalog before they burned the money. Uh, it was, I think, they, yeah, it was before then because they they burnt it in. Was it ninety four? Yes, yeah, okay. they, they 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 sort of quit. Uh, they quit being the band, um, and then they deleted their back catalog. Gotcha. But the weird thing was, they still worked together, but just not making music. And I and I can't think of any other equivalent where members of a band break up but still work together on some in some other way. Uh, closest I can come up with is like married couples who are in bands who sort of, you know, go off and do something, but nothing quite like this. And they basically set up what they called an art foundation. Um, art fa- art is one of those vague terms you can you can get away with a lot under the umbrella of art. You know, some right. really strange occult things. If you just go, oh, it's art. Yeah, you can sort of, you can sort of get away with it. But so there's there's a certain idea that they're just a, a creative pair and they move past music into something else, but they're still just yeah. work. And and what really struck me about this story um is that it it was almost like um uh, how, how would you say it? They were just following the the creative impulse, so to speak. They were mm-hmm. swept along by it, I think, is maybe some words you use. Like like this was much bigger than them. As yeah, if the I, universe was acting through them. I I see it in those terms very much. And I see them as um very much honoring the sort of initial impulse of a creative um work mm. before the you know the left brain, the rational side of your brain, um what right what William Blake would call Eurozen, before that sort of kicks in, starts critiquing it and and explaining mm. why it's a terrible idea and you should never sort of do it. They manage to sort of block that out and let the let the urge, let the idea become the thing that it wants to be, even when a thing it wants to be is a bonfire of a million pounds, which most nay pretty much everyone else would have you know the rational side of their brain would have kicked in to sort of say no i don't think that's a good idea i won't do that at all (laughs) um there's something about the way they work together they never argued they always Mm -hmm. understood each other they understood where they were both coming from um and sometimes all you need is, you know, someone to get it, someone to get what you want to do. And it did become um, probably quite a, an unhealthy cycle towards the end when um, their ideas were getting darker and stranger and darker and stranger. And the, you know, the original intention of that Brit Awards a ceremony I mentioned earlier was uh, like bill drummond was thinking i could i could chop off my hand i could chop off my hand and hurl it into the audience and that way i'd be reclaiming the music industry for a, a higher power similar to the old kings of ulster that's that was his that was his thinking and that's yeah, pretty heavy if you have someone with you who's like god's sake bob <laughs> God's sake, Bill! Don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Uh, that's probably healthy. But if you've got someone who understands where you're coming from and sort of sees it in the art terms, mm. um, things can get out of hand. Fortunately, they didn't do that. Fortunately, they didn't um, chop off. Didn't the... Instead, the, the plan was: we'll get a sheep, and uh, we'll get some chainsaws, and we'll slice up this sheep on stage. And it will be an act so terrible will never be forgiven. Right? That was that was where they wanted to go with their their Brit Awards performance, but it just so happened that they decided 
to do not the you know the a straight uh, version of their you know dance music number one hit um very very crowd pleasing sort of stuff. they decided to do it with the grindcore band extreme noise terror who you know at the time you didn't really get you know grindcore bands on television or award ceremonies like that it was just noise as far as people were concerned and it just so happened that extreme noise terror were hardcore vegans and they were not having anyone <laughs> chopping up a sheep with a chainsaw <laughs> during their set so that idea got <laughs> got scrapped as well the voice of reason comes yeah. through yeah but that, well so what strikes me is that the, the the creative partnership of these two survived the burning of a million pounds yeah i mean, I mean it, it has come back now i mean they after the burning of the million pounds they basically just kept apart mm. probably wisely because mm. you know it, together they could go to some strange places and in um 2017 23 years after the uh after the money burning they um they returned with a book called 2023 so you, you, you're seeing the um discordian influences very very clearly i'm sure in, in all all this not not any new music they wouldn't do that but a, a novel um and um and announced that they were going to build um the people's pyramid do you know about all this they they basically become undertakers They're, the 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 idea is when you die 23 grams of your ashes are baked inside a brick and every year the bricks of the people who die go into this pyramid uh, which is going to be in Liverpool, but it's, I think it's going to be over the Merseys. It's going to be in in in, uh, in Birkenhead, and it's been for about the past five years or so. On November the twenty third, there's been a, an event in Liverpool, the, the Toxteth Day of the Dead, and the first bricks have started to be built in this pyramid. And the idea will take about three hundred years to become this twenty three foot high uh, pyramid. Um, of um of a community really it's a most most death is very individualistic mm. you, know, you just put in a little box by yourself it didn't used to be you know the the old uh, uh if you look at the neolithic you know graves and things like that there were sort of communal graves and, uh, and things like that this this pyramid this 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 people's pyramid will be sort of a communal monument to uh friends and family and community and, and and things like that and at the moment you know pop stars start talking about death you know so the great to be people aren't happy people nobody you know, wants that really a lot of people really don't like it at all um but they you know they give them their due they've been pushing this for a num for a number of years and it's probably and it's, and the reason i mentioned it at all was it's it's those two working together mm -hmm. side of the world of music. You know, even, right. even if the world of undertaking was perhaps the an area you might not have expected them to, <laughs> to appear in. But, but taking undertaking down a different path. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Undertakers yeah. to the underworld, they call themselves. <laughs> they it's, embrace it's, that. It's, huh? Yeah, it's moomification. <laughs> the, the process. <laughs> Is yeah, there a brick of moo? It's got moo moo stamped uh, into the brick. There you have it. Is is yeah. there some significance with you? You mentioned November twenty third there. Uh, well, it's a Discordian Holy Day. Was it Harper oh. Marx's birthday? Oh, um, it's also uh, the birthday of Doctor Who. Uh, it's got a lot of sort of. I think the Illuminatus play originally debuted on November 23rd. Oh, wow. um, yeah, it's outside. I mean, maybe day is probably more famous these days as the Discordian day in July. The, is it July the 23rd, I think it is. Yes. Uh, November, the, November the 23rd is, is the uh, is the day of the dead over here now. So 
to the extent this burning of a million pounds was a magical act on the consciousness of the planet what what's the if we were to speculate wildly what's the fallout what are the, the yeah. you know, mike that's that's a very big question <laughs> i do i do i do think you have to you know when you're trying to come to terms with it or understand it those are the sort of frameworks which you are where you sort of have to go because it was a consciousness shift because it was such a taboo you know mm -hmm. entire life money is the goal you're taught taught a goal the society is structured so that it is the goal you need this so, so some people to sort of it's not it's not like the money was wasted you know most pop mm. stars waste money you know um and that way it, the money just continues to slosh around the economy which is what it's supposed to be but this was like money being denied right? this was money right. being negated right that is why people were so appalled like so horrified and still are to, to, to this day um understandably so you know it was it was a deep deep taboo um and i do feel a bit like a depth charge you know like the with the klf the you know the hit singles with the, the surface the um mm. the waves the foam and uh and it's, but deep deep down there's this sort of depth charge is let off and it's much and it's acting on a much sort of slower but sort of deeper scale um yeah quite what we'll make of it i mean it's it's the i mean money's changed so much since then for a lot of people now they don't physically have make money a paper money right uh, certainly uh, certainly over here people are so much more used to just think paying things on their phone and you know they're they might have a crypto app on their phone which tells them that they've got you know fifty thousand pounds and then the next day it's all gone you know <laughs> the, the idea that money can just disappear like that has sort of became become sort of a li little bit more sort of normal um <laughs> at the oh, time at, at, at the at the time, though, this was you know, suitcases of paper notes, you know, which seemed fixed and solid. And if you had them, then you'd won, you know, you'd won the mm. rat race. You, you know, you'd, you'd got the goal. You had these things. So to, to sort of take those and just spend a couple of hours. Right. Shocking them into this fireplace one after the other. And I always say it's, you know, one thing to... Uh, start burning a million pounds <laughs> quite another thing to finish you know it just it just sh it just shows there was a compulsion behind it and the, the compulsion was so strong that they acted on it that they that they felt they had to act on it and uh trying to understand that urge right it's really what i think drove the book gotcha it, it reminds me of our earlier conversation about power versus imagination and creativity mm. and how mm. this was kind of more of that imaginative creative act that that acts on the world subtly as opposed yeah. to the directness of power yeah um, uh, yes exactly yes exactly and that, yeah. but, but for a very unpredictable outcomes I would, <laughs> I would say. right right and because it's subtle and perhaps indirect it's really hard to to pin down but those seem to be sort of the things that capture your attention and and uh as a writer yeah, yeah and i think the lack of intent is is also fascinating to me you know most certainly most it's i mean in I, in the new version of the book i've basically gone back and looked at the text again after 10 years and added 13,000 words of footnotes. I haven't changed the, the text, the actual book, but I've added me now looking back, trying to make sense of what this book is. The book is basically trying to make sense of them. The footnotes are me trying to make sense of the book because the book's had a life of its own this past decade. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a spiky and powerful thing in its own own sort of way and um 
where was I going with that? There was a reason I mentioned that. Oh, yes, I, yes. Uh, I, in the footnotes to this new edition, I sort of, I sort of point out that um, magic, it talks a lot about magic. It talks about people like Alan Moore and it uses his, his models to sort of describe it all. And that is sort of useful. But what they were doing wasn't sort of the imposing of your will on you know, the cosmos. It, there wasn't a sense of intent behind it. So it wasn't really magic as we might might sort of think about it most of their work um talks of transcendence there's a real mm. urge to transcendence in in their music mm. it's, like, it's like the white room they want to get to the white room it's like 3 a.m eternal you know it's it's uh, the last train to transcendental it's um it's trying it's trying to get um past that whereas with magic in the sense of imposing your will on the right to create an effect you have to see yourself as separate from the cosmos right with transcendence that's just ridiculous that's there is no there is no difference there's no separation you know so it isn't the notion of it as a magical act is what i think the, the book has a lot of people have been left with from the book i think the fact it's got the word magic in the title chaos magic and the bounty bird to bring it back it has been seen as as magic a lot, and I, I think it is something different. Mm. You know, I th hopefully, the, the the new footnotes will sort of tip it slightly away from that. But uh, there, is, there is it is something different going on, and and the lack of intent is a big part of it. it it's almost to me like the universe in, enacted its intention through them. Yeah, I can see it in those terms as well. Yeah. Okay. Very like they were so. just instruments of, of the they, they they were open and um and agreeable to you know <laughs> what was needed. Willing God, participants. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um well tell me uh switching gears here. Why William Blake and what's he got against the world? <laughs> yeah, it's well, it's what the world had against him as well. Is that as, it? As well. I mean, it's easy to see William Blake as tragic. You know, he mm. died penniless. He uh, was put in a pauper's burial outside of um, central London. He, he had one... Ex solo exhibition in his entire life and it, mm. it was it was above his brother's shop you know it wasn't oh, in a wow. proper gallery uh, and they didn't sell a thing and they got one review which called him an unfortunate idiot no sorry an, an, an unfortunate lunatic you know which is harsh very very harsh so it's very easy to see him in the terms of the material world as a failure mm. So uh, the world versus William Blake was very much a win for the world on those. But that wasn't what he was about at all on his terms. You know, he was about he was one of the richest men in the world. You know, uh, he was, you know, he was so um, close to paradise. You know, he was he was so often in paradise. Right. He could, he could see the world was golden. You know, he was. Um, he had an enchanted life. He was, and it's particularly towards the end, he seemed to be so happy, you know, on on his terms, on spiritual terms, you know. Um, I mean, he, he talked about he didn't mind living in poverty because, you know, in eternity he lived in a mansion beyond which anyone could ever imagine, you know, and, and things like that. Um, and that's where the title William Blake versus the world came from because... Uh, there's, you know, there's two different territories being those for that 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 particular fight, um, and I think he's he's so important to me um, because he essentially viewed the world fundamentally differently to the West of Western 
civilization and Western philosophy and Western thought. There's a there's um there's an idea buried so deep in the foundations of, of Western thinking that it's never questioned and it's never sort of examined. It's it's uh, it's the notion that the um the divine, you know, the immaterial is beyond. It's like it's like elsewhere. Yeah. Right. It's like the, but yes, there's a heaven, but you have it's not in this life. It's 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 away from you. And it's not um and it's a peculiarly purely Western way of looking at the world. You don't get it in Vedic thought, you don't get it in Chinese thought. It sort of came with the Greeks. Um Plato probably popularized it the most with this notion of the world of forms you know for for a chair to exist in this world there must be in the world of forms the idea of a a path perfect archetypal sort of chair but that's elsewhere that sort of a way mm, right. and um when the early christian church uh was getting going it, it was the idea they used to sort of separate you know the god of israel from the land of Israel, you know, the the idea that the divine was was beyond the material world; it was elsewhere. Therefore, that God could be a universal God. You know, uh, so all the the monasteries of the medieval ages, and then the the you know, the universities, the Oxford and Cambridge and stuff like that, very deeply in in their entire way of thinking, is this sense of being separate mm. from the divine. Um, and Blake, you know, he wasn't, he didn't go to school. He wasn't taught. He was just, he just had visions from a very early age. And it was very clear to him that that was just wrong. You know, you know, if the divine is anywhere, if if the divine exists, like it, it's here, you know, it, it's here now. Um, it's within. Um, and so nobody understood him. <laughs> yeah nobody at the time could make sense of you know his philosophy he was clearly on to something you know there was a power to his work his both both his poetry and his painting that was undeniable but his philosophy was just so at odds with everything else um that he was just dismissed as a madman and you know and just and it's only 200 years later that we you know you know we've got an, enough of a sense of where he was sort of coming from to sort of i don't think anyone would ever claim to understand everything he was saying you know you know mis mystics are, are talking on a um a, a, a level that's in our normal finite fixed sort of logical rational world you know we with it's too small to sort of grasp what they're doing um but he he does seem to me a, you know a better starting point for understanding the 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 world and the cosmos and the nature of the cosmos than pretty much you know anyone else and it's mm. it's, it's like the further we get away from him and the more um, our understanding of the world changes and the our understanding of him grows, the more we go, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, he was right about it. It's kind of like he was way ahead of us and we're just sort of right. slowly, slowly catching up. Um, so and, and it's a, it, so it's all that's fascinating. But more importantly, it's just, um, it's just, it's just, joyful and pleasurable mm. and life affair yeah. to, to have this notion that uh you know paradise is your birthright and it's, it's mm. here now and it's not theoretical and when you you just need to you get a glimpse of it occasionally and that's enough to know that it it sort of exists and it opened i mean you know, i was uh, in the you know 21st century most of us most of the culture is fairly secular you know and uh, people don't genuinely believe that say hell is a real place that exists somewhere that you could be sent to they don't genuinely believe that but with blake all sort of spiritual aspects heaven hell gods demons angels they're all interior states they're all part of our, our 
and we all know someone who's been living in hell and we all know that that's it'd be wrong to deny that because it's it's too important too sort of real and once you accept notions of hell as you know you know reflections of the soul or however you wanted to put it as like as our internal uh, state suddenly the notion of heaven becomes plausible you know you could you could live you could live in paradise you could live in sort of heaven um and that's an idea in almost entirely missing from the rest of our culture you know so to find to find that in blake i find very very useful very very um right. uh wonderful yeah uh-huh. The, this idea of creating heaven or paradise on earth. Yeah. Um, it almost feels to me, the word alien has a lot of stigma around it, but this is some sort of alien mutant that that came from this world of paradise and ended up here on earth, somehow managed to survive and, and is now trying to bring that to the rest of the planet. Maybe that's just my imagination run wild, but... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for 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 Blake, the um, the divine aspect of the universe was the imagination. Mm. That's what transforms, you know, the the meaningless matter of the physical world uh, into, you know, some eternal paradise at the, at, at the peak. Um, and so, you know, and he would, as he he would claim to have been a Christian, but his understanding of of jesus was jesus was the imagination and he would talk about how you couldn't be a christian if you weren't an artist or a painter or an architect or you know some sort of creative person it's by actively using the imagination that the divine sort of uh becomes apparent um in our world and uh it's not the worst model for these things no. I won't, you know it's quite interesting to see things in those terms Right, so using imagination and maybe the creative act to manifest uh, paradise. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, this is this. It's fascinating how many of the ideas in Robert Anton Wilson you find in William Blake. They're just expressed differently because they're from different cultures and and things like that. But the notion that reality is a Rorschach ink block test. And we basically see what we expect to see, and we sort of, you know, create the world in our own image. Um, is there in both? It's there, it's, uh, there in both, and they, they're very, you know, centuries separated them and things like that. But you know, the truth is the truth. People are going to stumble on it. And uh, I'm I'm curious about how uh, writing about all these things has affected you over the years did you looking at your old work did you see how you have uh changed over the years yeah i was um probably less than i thought i mean i kind of had hoped that oh well i'm you know i've got a lot of experience now i know what i'm doing now i'm I'm sort of I, I, i could i could do these things better now and um look back i hadn't really changed as much <laughs> as i thought uh, there's a few there's a few things i would sort of sort of change but um i don't know there's, there's a pool of ideas that i'm still exploring and but really it's the, the same pool of ideas you just see it coming up differently in in all these different you know aspects um that's what I'm wondering. And and so it's is that just something you're just continuing to explore that? And maybe that's just the mystery to continue to be explored. Yeah, I think that's it. It's the mystery that you continue to explore. And I'm all trying to make sense isn't one of the right words. Is to to uh come to terms in a way that feels workable and positive with the universe, you know. You know, they, mm. they, we, there's um, you know, there's horrors as much as there are joys. There always they are. There's there's uh, Blake's very big on dualities. You yeah. can't have heaven without hell. They're 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 not. This is 
yeah, this is this is probably a whole other, <laughs> uh, a whole other you know whirlpool to go down, Mike. But um, um, I, a lot of it is to do is to try to find a, a sort of um, a healthy relationship with the universe that is not blinkered and not in denial of the darkness. But, mm. which is ultimately you know a, a pleasure i guess to, to 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 find the world of pleasure is uh it's as good as goal as we're going to find i think nice you, you mentioned something about darkness there i, I wasn't just not to exclude the darkness yeah. in you yeah you can't you can't exclude exclude the darkness it's um we we sort of the world the the model of the world in our minds which you know we're born without it you know we're, we're kind of like a blank slate we can we can like suckle and we can grasp and stuff like that we don't have a model of the world and a newborn baby you know, all their senses are working, but all, all the information coming in is just chaos because they yeah. can't categorize it. They don't make any sense of it. It's like um, they have no, a newborn baby has no concept of color. It's not that their eyes don't work. It's just they don't know what it is. And that the first first thing that they start to realize is, is light and dark, like right. night and day. They start to realize, oh, these are two sort of different things. That's why they really like checkerboard patterns babies where you like checkerboard patterns of black and white and you know uh and after light and dark you know they become aware of you know maybe hot and cold you know hungry not hungry you know it's it's in it's in opposites that we right. start to, to 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 build the world and we still do and we always will do and we can't understand uh, you know blake was always angry about people who who would who were you know talk about heaven but would shun hell because you can't have one without the other says he sort of sort of, you, you they're always there and you know that's sort of upon me as the world sort of changes and, and we progress and many things you know in, improve um yet we always see you know the, it's always the worst possible time in, in history you know, and always the best. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whatever point in our lives. You know, we always think, God, this must the the bad things must be the worst they've ever been. And you know, at the moment, yeah, I would look at the world. This must be the worst they've ever been. You know, it's it's awful. These things that are happening in various parts of the world. But if you'd have asked me the same at any point in the past twenty years, I'd have probably said the same thing. It's always the, the sort of <laughs> so. When there yeah. are great, great advances in, you know, life expectancy, you know, lack of um, uh, particularly childhood poverty around the world, there's, there's, there's great things going, going, going on. And uh, it's, we never sort of go, oh, the world's better now because we just have the, we see the world in terms of, you know, these dualities. There's always the dualities. There always will be, we'll always do it. And, um, it's the kind of the energy between them that sort of keeps the world mm. sort of moving. So we, you have to accept both. Um, but there is a great tendency, particularly amongst writers, uh, commentators and, and things like that to only see the dark. Uh. And if there's, that's if there's just the dark uh, and it, you know, it sort of helps you get attention. It helps you sort of get clear. You're taken very seriously if you can say, I've come up with an entirely new way of thinking why you were all fucked. You know, <laughs> you're, you, you can do very, very well with that. If you if you say something more positive, people are a little bit suspicious, you know. Mm. Is, is, is he selling something? You know, <laughs> has that sort of air you know you only sort right. of see positive things in adverts really and we know they're lies <laughs> so we're not we don't we distrust them but if someone was to say something you know it was was terrible in a whole new way you go oh i respect and 
you know that that person that's a, that's sort of that's a credible sort of sort of mm. person. But you know you need the both. You really right if you don't have the both, you don't have the picture. Don't so you're picture. you're not trying to deny it. And there's this other side, this positive yeah. side, and and I really appreciate you've wrote written some books on uh, or a book on technology in the future, and and it it, it involves optimism. Yes, well, mainly because that book was written in the sort of the sort of mid Trump period, when it was just nothing but sort of horror and cynicism in in the media and in the world and in in people's discussions there was just there was just no glimpses of any 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 positive sort of side of things or any optimism or anything like that um so it kind of felt needed to balance things out a bit better to balance things out better. since it was written i do see positive voices more often i do mm -hmm. think there's an increase in them and a, and a recognition that they are sort of needed um which is which is kind of a relief but yeah when that book was written i was just thought you know where where where's this other side yes. where is my, where's the balance to all this sort of thing all the optimism got sucked out of the room during those years yeah it certainly did it certainly did do you you wrote a blog post uh somewhat recently about artificial intelligence um and of course artificial intelligence has been the hot buzz thing these these days do you have uh current opinions on all that where we're going with um not particularly what was what was i saying in this blog post uh, there was something about artificial intelligence and, and what you touched on was the subject of authenticity Maybe you're talking about oh, AI art yeah. at that time. Yeah, that was that was, it was that was. I think I just. Yeah, I probably did tie that into, into AI. Um, this was something the musician Richard Norris said. Richard Norris, um, he was in a band called The Grid, but he's been very much involved in psychedelic and underground music for for decades, and he's a fascinating guy. And he's he was saying, you know, all through my career, I've always like worried about authenticity you know, the, the, mm. the, in music you need authenticity and we all know that you know some of the greatest music isn't authentic in any way shape or form even if it's presented as such um and it's been a bit of a sort of a, a struggle to sort of accept why we're searching for authenticity and what it was and he had a bit of a breakthrough and he realized that it wasn't authenticity he was interested in it was things that it was things that were genuine mm. you know, if, you, if you're it's the stuff that's genuine that counts and that's what that's what matters and that sort of slight sort of shifting of uh things he found really helpful he found really helpful in his own music and in judging other music and i found it really helpful as well uh in in you know just understanding art in general yeah there's something about you know, that. a bit of artifice is it's the art, yeah. a bit of artifice is fine you know <laughs> right there's there's something about what we've been talking about imagination creativity and uh i don't know the verb but is it genuine um yeah i mean about... genuine is it's it's a it's a proper expression of the creative impulse you know it is right. what it's supposed to be right authentic is it fits with this background, you know. It's mm, from that background or gotcha. something like that. But it, it, with genuine, it makes sense on its own terms, and it is its own. It is its own thing. Uh, and I, yeah, I found that a very helpful way of thinking about these things. Uh, right. And so, and so, with things like AI art and the temptation is, you have to say it's one thing or the other. It's good or it's bad, or it's useful or it's useless, or something like that. And it's i find it more useful to think of it as whether it's just genuine or not it's by that i mean um there was there's a lot of people using ai versions of various musicians voices uh and creating things and putting them on youtube 
Um, and most of them are terrible, you know, and <laughs> most of them have no reason to, to, to exist at all. Um, and uh, there was there was an AI version of the Beatles singing Pet, uh, pet Sounds and um, Beach Boy songs that right. came across. And it was like, yeah, there's no point to this. There's absolutely no point to this at all. Um, but then I found, um, was it Dear Friend? It was a Paul McCartney song about John. I think it was from a later album. It was quite a late Paul McCartney song. And someone had added John singing on it. Oh. And it just and it just had such an emotional you know, weight to it because of this. It was such a powerful thing uh, that clearly to me it was a genuine artistic statement, you know. So even though it's AI and fucking about with other things, it still moved me. And so it was valid right. in a way that a lot of the, well, probably about 99% of the AI experiments are just well, weird and quirky. And, you know, some of it's fun. I mean, there was Frank Sinatra singing Lana Del Rey's video games out there. It's great. It shouldn't work, but it really does. You know, that's that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So, I mean. There's Sorry. something about about the way that moved you that, that yeah. uh, speaks to its, I was going to say authenticity, but I don't have the word for genuine, genuineness, I guess. It's yeah. Genuinity. Yeah. I, yeah. It, it has value. It was, it was, you know, uh, it, it, it's good that it existed, if you know what I mean. Um, and so for all the questions with AI uh, in, in particularly with the corporations that own it and the, the use of everyone's work and the um, putting people out of work and uh, particularly, you know, illustrators and, and people like that for all their sort of problems with it. Um, it is here. It does exist. I mean, the raw uses of it that seem positive, but they're, you know, they're not, they're not the majority of it by a long chalk. Right. Kind of like the internet in general. There's a lot of junk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It does it does feel like um uh, with, with going back to the KLF, the their the early stuff as the justified agents of Moo Moo. That's when samplers were first uh, around. And right. no one really had a sense of you know, how you were supposed to use them, what was morally acceptable. What was legally acceptable, um, you know, at that time, people developed a sense of those things over time. So in the, the Justify Ancient Mumu first first album, they were just sampling huge chunks of ABBA and huge chunks of the Beatles, you know, not to go get a beat or get a sound or something, but because they were ABBA and the Beatles, and it was sort of like reclaiming them and and, and mm. uh, the touring them out or something like that, uh, and the. Abba's lawyers came down. <laughs> they were not happy, uh, and as a result, all the copies of that first album had to be burned. Uh, and you look back now and you think, "Well, what were they thinking? You're obviously not going to take, you know, that much of an Abba song and just put it out yourself. It's just ridiculous." But we're kind of like at that stage with AI in music now, and people don't really know what's morally acceptable, what's legally acceptable, you know. Can you can turn a voice into Drake, and you can make Drake do these things, and you can make them duet with the weekend and all, all this stuff. But you know, no one's quite sure if they should. Yeah, right. You know, we're, so we're still at that sort of that's that sort of stage. My 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 boy, my son, he'd been messing around with all this sort of stuff, and I was asking him what he's up to. He's going, well, I, you know, I. I recorded a vocal line myself and then I put it through this AI uh, that changed it into the weekend uh, to sound like the weekend and then I put it through another AI to change it so it sounded like Ed Sheeran and then I layered them on top of each other and then I started glitching between them and you know 
it sounded quite interesting. <laughs> we put wow. it, and they're just like, oh, this generation's going to be fine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 you know, these things that terrify us. Right. You know, that that, that um, they're just playing with. They're growing up on, they're with it. Playing, yeah. That's just normal strings to play toys for them. You, you said something a, a minute ago about the sampling of the KLF. And if I heard you, or maybe I interpret it as like this was their claiming of those songs almost to me like, hey, this song is bigger than the Beatles. This is a belongs to all of us and we're taking it and we're going to use it. Yeah, there's definitely that sense sense of things. You know, the um, they did a version. There's a, a Dave Clark song, Take Five, and they used that in a version called Don't Take Five, Take What You Want. You know, it was. <laughs> um, it, it's it, there's a lot of situationist ideas in there. You know, and mm. the idea that um, the uh, what they call the spectacle, really the culture, all the the. Uh, adverts and you know you can't exist in in the world today without being bombarded by you know uh adverts with disney plus shows and songs and things like whether you want them or not you have you get them um and there's no way to escape them mm. and as the situationist saw the only thing you could really do is just to fuck with it that's all you could do is just embrace it, it and, and, and embrace it. with it and you can't escape the spectacle but you can just you know mess with it as much as you like and they were pretty much on that level i think i think that's where they were they were coming from back in the day gotcha well john uh it's been a pleasure chatting with you here um i know you've got a big announcement coming in a few weeks uh, we're speaking on november 2nd and this will come out after yeah, that yeah. but uh -huh. Look forward to hearing what you've got planned. Um, yes, I, I look forward to announcing it. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Is there anything uh, you'd like to speak to at the moment here? We, you've got your website and all your projects brewing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty easily found. I'm on uh, johnhiggs.com. Um, I do. Uh, I've just finished my last public event. Um for and i don't think i'm going to do any more for about 18 months until about 2025 i've just done a you know i've had a, a lot of things out in recent times from the, yeah. the love and let die book to the klf reissue and things like and a bunch of other things and i just seem to have been endlessly going out and talking about them and i kind <laughs> of i'm a kind of aware that our culture's full of people going, I must put out more content. I must, mm. you know, tweet more. I must put out more on Instagram. Please like and subscribe. Could you share? Yeah, people asking their patrons, what do you want of me? What do you want of me? I will give you what you want of me. And, and I kind of feel it'd be nice just to step back and go quiet for a bit. Um, I still, I'll still send out my newsletter, you know, six times a year. Um, eight times a year, sorry. Um, so I'm not going completely quiet, but I've like I've got out the habit of like looking at Twitter since that's mm. all gone so wrong. Yeah. I sort of have to force myself to remember to look every morning in case there's any messages. But I can see myself moving away from social media and, and having to go and doing things. So I'll, I'll just go quiet for a while. It's it's what I'm sort of hoping to do, and then 2025 I'll be I'll be going. Please buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> So, so maybe not necessarily a, a next project in mind, but just the intent to focus. If I hear, yeah, that. I'm going to get a, I'm getting a lot done because um, I want to get there's, there's yeah there's multiple books on the go at, wow. at the moment. So um, it would be nice. They're nice these things where you go out and you see people and you meet people and. Um, you make connections and they, they are important they are value but they they are distracting you mm -hmm. know from from when you get your the deep when you go deep deep into the thing you're working on and you, you you need to spend a lot of time on that sort of level to make the really good connections and to make the really you know make it really work and really sing so i think next year i'll try and be a bit quiet uh and then well, I won't. I won't be dead or anything like that. I will return. <laughs> I will return. <laughs> I will return.
Well, excellent. I, I certainly appreciate you making time for us here. And I look forward to seeing what, what you come up with in, in 2025, I guess. Uh, it's lovely talking to you, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. That concludes the episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. A big thank you to John Higgs for taking the time to chat. Thank you, as always, to Christina Pearson of the Robert Anton Wilson Trust and Richard Rossa of Hilaritas Press. Scott Appel will be my guest on the next episode, releasing on the 23rd of January. Until then, I am your host, Mike Gathers, signing off with love and cheerfulness. Amor a Hilaritas. Thank you.